Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. For the first time on our show, we are going to hear an incredible story about reincarnation. I saw our guest today on a television show called Beyond Belief with George Norrie, and I know you'll be amazed by her story. Her name is Susan Messino, a rock and roll journalist for over 30 years who has written several books and produced many music compilation CDs. Her latest book is titled ACDC FAQ, All That's Left to Know About the World's True Rock and Roll Band. However, since the age of five, Susan Messino has had a strong interest in the paranormal. In her book, The Secrets of the Universe, Susan dives into her lifelong passion of the spiritual and paranormal side of life. Now, if you go to wedontdieradio.com and click on episode 85, you'll see this extraordinary woman that we're talking to today. So, Susan Messino, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much for having me. I have just like this huge smile on my face. You can probably hear it. Um, You and I got to be on actually the same television show, but at different times, um, with George Norrie, who is the host of Coast to Coast AM, which many of you might know happens in the wee hours. Uh, But Susan, I spent the morning uh, re-watching the television show. And for anyone who's interested in that, if you go to Beyond Belief dot com and just type in Susan Messino you can see it so Susan I'm do- I've done enough talking how does a person first of all become so interested in rock and roll and ACDC and can you give us a little bit about who you are maybe where you're talking to us from and uh, a little of your past yeah well I'm uh, right now I'm in Savannah Georgia very nice but I am from Wisconsin. I moved down here just a few months ago to be near my son and my sister, and uh, it is one of the most haunted cities in the United States, so I have a lot to explore down here. Yes. But um, my career has been writing about uh, music and rock and roll. Uh, I started way back in um, the late 70s where I met a band who was playing in a bar in Madison, Wisconsin, called ACDC. Okay. Uh, they, They were broke. (laughs) No one knew who they were. And uh, we became great friends as far as I got to see them every time they came through the area. And I still see them. I'm going to go up and see them play in Washington, D.C. in two weeks on St. Patrick's Day. And uh, I've been friends with them for, it'll be 39 years this summer. (laughs) That's incredible. (laughs) It is kind of crazy for a girl from Wisconsin, but um, I, uh, and I grew up with um, the knowledge of the paranormal through my grandmother. Okay. My, my grandmother, uh, her mother, when she passed away, she told us, she would, you know, we would lay in bed at night. So funny, it's like a great way to terrorize a five-year-old, but I was fascinated <laughs> by it. But she would tell us a story about how her mother came back to her, um, actually appeared in her bedroom after her death to say goodbye and to tell her that everything was, was all right. And that was about at the age of five or six years old. And ever since, I've wanted to to know the truth. I've I've been, you know, discovering things and exploring things and experiencing a lot during my life. And uh, there, to me, there's no doubt that we do survive after death. That's such good news. It is, yes. And but but it, you know, it. Uh, it makes things very interesting because it's like, well, if we do, then what is our purpose here in this lifetime? Right. That's, that's my biggest question. People hear me say that all the time. If we don't die, what is our life for, you know, and what's it all about? Right, so, exactly. And I think it's, I, I honestly think that, well, we're here to love people. You know, I mean, love is, is uh, transcends everything. And, uh, and I think that we're here simply to become better better souls, that we're, we're here to evolve and to learn, and that's where reincarnation comes in, in my opinion, that uh, if we don't learn what we were meant to learn in a lifetime, that we do have a, a choice to come back and, and do it another way. 
and uh, which sometimes is good and sometimes not so good. <laughs> I mean, funny. I don't know if I want to come back or not. I'm kind of ready for something new. <laughs> you say that now. You never know. And, and, and the idea of reincarnation to me is refreshing in a couple of ways. I mean, we live in a time where we recycle our cans, our bottles, our newspapers. It doesn't make sense that you get one shot at life and then it's over. Or if you take even the, the death of a child, you know, they only get maybe a few months or a few years and that's it. It's like, it just doesn't make sense. And then even the fact, and this is just me talking because who knows what the truth is. But if you imagine a place called heaven with the billions and billions and billions of people that have come to this earth and bodies passed away that they're all crowded in one place i mean it just to me sounds yeah. like oh there'd be some recycling of these souls you know yeah there's got to be movement there you I know um so. and that that's what i think is fascinating is that i believe that once you cross over and you leave your physical body that again it's free will and it's up to you in a mental state what you want to do mm -hmm. which is the possibilities are endless yeah. Can we talk a little bit about your story that you shared on TV? Because that's the one that, like, my jaw dropped, like, oh, my gosh. Uh, it's, and it deals with your son. Would you mind sharing that with us? Absolutely, yes. My, my son, Jamie, who is now 22 years old, mm -hmm. um, old when he was born, he was just, um, just an amazing little guy. And uh, as he got uh, closer to the age of three, um, he first told me about a life that he had building the railroad cars back okay. in Wyoming. All right. That was his first um, memory of a past life. And he was, because he was fascinated with trains and, you know, and he used to talk about Wyoming. I mean, he, he couldn't even pronounce Wisconsin, but everything was all Wyoming for the longest time. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, I wrote things down. I started to keep a journal. And uh, and it and then I found out later, as I did a little bit of research, that the the original uh, railroad cars in the United States were built in Wyoming. Hmm. Pretty cool. Which was really like you know, and that that passed that that phase of his life didn't last real long. I'd say maybe a few months of talking about it, and then it kind of you know faded away. And uh, so one night, um, my husband and I went out, and we left him with a babysitter. And they were showing the movie Titanic on HBO at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently, um, we came home that night and found out that Jamie had gotten up in the middle of, of the night. And she was watching the movie, so he, she let him come out and sit and watch the rest of the Titanic. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was about uh, three or four at the time. And, of course, I was not real happy with that because, you know, that's not a movie that I would sit. Not right. Yeah, exactly, that I would sit a child down and say, here, go ahead, let's, you know, watch all these people die. And uh, the next day, though, um, he was just completely, just absorbed, fascinated with the ship itself. It was, it, all he talked about was the ship, how it was built. This was just from seeing the end of the movie. Okay. And for the next two weeks, he, he loved to draw. He was, he was into to a lot of, you know, artwork, watercolors, pencil drawings. He really loved that. And for the next two weeks, he literally painted and drew probably over 50 pictures of the Titanic. Wow. And this was all from memory. He was not going off like pictures of the boat itself. Right. And the more he was... Um, the more he became involved in it, the more he started telling me things that I, I kept a journal because it was, it was crazy. I was like, how, how does he know this stuff? And he used to cry over the fact that when the ship hit the iceberg, the emergency doors in the boiler rooms were meant to, to come down and shut, you know, to, for safety doors. They shut down, but they, they, they trapped the men that, you know, shoveled the coal into the boilers, they trapped them and they couldn't get out. So they were the first people to die when the Titanic hit the iceberg. Wow. And my son used to sob over this. He used to just wail and say, Mama, Mama, this, that shouldn't have happened that way. It shouldn't have happened that way. It was a mistake. It was all a mistake. And I kept saying, well, honey, I know, I know, I understand it was... 
it was terrible. It was a terrible accident. And he's like, no, no, you don't understand. There, there was things that were wrong. There were things that, that were, they rushed, they rushed things. And so over the, this lasted, it ended up lasting for two years. And this all starts that, when he's three, four years old, right? Yeah, yeah. It was between mainly the ages of four and six. Okay, that okay. He, he did nothing, but he want, he wanted everything he could get his hands on about the Titanic. Every okay. book, every video, every game, every toy. And he constantly, constantly talked about how it was built and that it was built wrong. There were, there were corners cut that didn't need to be cut. They should have had enough lifeboats. Um, just, you know, I mean, things, the, the one thing that really got me was, uh, one time he came home cause of course now he's, he's drawing paintings of, uh, the Titanic, you know, every day on everything, you know, tablecloths and restaurants. Um, the, are the they back of, just the Titanic or is it like the Titanic sinking pictures? Oh, everything. The, oh. the Titanic sailing, pardon me, on a sunny day, uh, the Titanic breaking apart, the Titanic uh, with people falling out into the water, oh um, the Titanic, you know, broken in half. Um, it, it just it, it, amazing pictures. One, one of the pictures was if you took like, um, if you cut the, the ship in half uh, lengthwise, uh-huh. he had a pencil drawing that he drew every single um, level of the ship and then he had all the rooms and all, I mean, it was right down to the light fixtures and the coat hooks inside the rooms. Wow, Susan. I mean, it was, it was amazing and very, I, it was just so, I, I couldn't fathom my son going through this, but it slowly, I had to accept the fact that he was there. Mm-hmm. That there was no way that he knew all these things just from seeing the end of a movie. Right. And uh, so he he kept on going into this, you know, for for two years. He ended up having night terrors where he would go to sleep at night. He would sleep for maybe an hour. It would usually be within the first hour. And all of a sudden you would hear him get up. He would bolt out of bed and he would start running. And he would run all over the house, opening doors, um, looking in places, he, he, and he wasn't aware of, of me or, or anybody around him, mm-hmm. but seemed like he was trying to get out. He was trying to, to escape somehow. Oh. And this went on for uh, the longest time. And uh, one day um, he came home with a, a drawing of the ship, and it had smoke coming out of three out of the four smokestacks. Mm-hmm. And uh, he showed that to me, and it was a great drawing. And I said, oh, this is really nice. And I said, well, did you run out of time, honey? Why, why is there no smoke coming out of the, the fourth smokestack? And he just looked at me, you know, like, oh, my God, you're not, you're just not up to speed. You know, he was always, he was a little sarcastic. And, and uh, he said, oh, Mama, he kind of shook his head. He goes, that's a dummy stack. And I said, uh excuse me, uh, what's, a, what's a dummy stack? And he said, it, it, it's for show, it's fake. They didn't need it. They just thought it would look good. They, 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 they didn't use it. It was a dummy stack. Well, years later, as they did documentaries on the Titanic, I found out that that was true. Oh, my gosh. You know, they did have one stack that was not a real smokestack. It was just for show. Mm-hmm. And that, that did it for me. Then, then I was like, oh, my God, this kid was way too much about it. And then another turning point was when we got a CD-ROM game that you put in your computer Mm -hmm. and you're actually on the Titanic. It's like a mystery game. Okay. And you have to find your way, like you knock on a door and they tell you to go to, you know, deck C to the, you know, the bridge or whatever. And you're looking for items and it's all a mystery game. And uh, he started playing. It was really hard actually to kind of maneuver and my daughter, who is a psychologist, she came home for the holidays, and up until this point, she thought I was crazy. Yes. <laughs> she, just, yep. she just said, you know, he's fascinated with the Titanic, like kids love Star Wars and Mickey Mouse and things like that, and there's just, there's no way that, you know, he was on the Titanic. That's just crazy. So she comes home, and he's playing the game, and I told her, I said, go in and sit with them and play that game with them for a little while and then tell me what you think. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they sat down together, and about 20 minutes into it, 
she comes running out of his room and she grabs me and pulls me down the hall and she goes, he knows his way around the ship. And I said, yeah, that's what I've been trying to tell you. And she says, no, 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 you don't, no, no. He's ordering me. He's telling me, go port, go port. If you go up that staircase, you'll be on the bridge and then you'll have to, you know, then you'll be on the starboard side. And, and, and she was just, I mean, she was white as a ghost and she was just floored. And she said, oh my God, there's no way that he would know how to get around the ship unless he had, had been on it. And not many kids I, use port and starboard for left and right. Exactly. And he always did that. And he always barked orders at us. It was hilarious. He used to say stuff to us, like to my husband or myself. And if he wanted you to do something right away, he would go and straight away now, straight away, which is a strictly an English term. It sure is. So it was, we used to joke about it. You know, we used to think, hmm, you know, obviously he spent time in England or something at, at some point because he, he actually had a little bit of an accent and he would use port and starboard. Wow. Which was crazy. And so I got to the point where I'm thinking he either worked on the ship or he helped build the ship mm -hmm. is what I was thinking that he definitely helped build it because he talked about that they used um, iron instead of steel. They should have used steel because the iron became brittle in the freezing water in the, in the ocean, and that's why when they hit the iceberg that a hole, you know, was cut into the side of the ship. That wouldn't have happened if it would have been made of steel. And they don't talk about that in the movie either. <laughs> right, right, they don't. No, none of this, a lot of no. this stuff they don't talk about in the movie. And, uh, and when I think about it now, I never let him sit down and watch the whole movie at that age. I think, I don't know if he ever did. I think maybe as he got older, he might have, mm -hmm. but I never let him watch the movie again because I was like, you know, this is not something for a small child to watch. So, so he, we went through like two years of this and he's painting and drawing and talking more and more about, you know, his life at that time. And, uh, you know, what happened, you know, it was just such a tragedy that he said that was so preventable that he would, he felt really like he acted very responsible for it. Like wow. it just shouldn't have happened. So, and he was particularly uh, transfixed with the, the boiler room and the men in the boiler room that mm -hmm. couldn't get out. He felt horrible about that. Sure. So when uh, the Titanic exhibit finally started to, to, was created and started to um, go across the United States, we heard that it was going to be held at the uh, Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago in uh, the year 2000, and now Jamie is six at the time. Mm -hmm. And, of course, my daughter heard about it first, and she got a hold of me, and she's like, we have to take him. We just have to. And I said, yeah, I know. I said, he, he, we have to go, even though he's six years old. He's got to see this. So we bought tickets. We drove down to Chicago. And, uh, and Jamie, you know, he was thrilled. He was excited. He was, um, he was just like, he couldn't wait. He couldn't wait to see it. So when we got there, we were with, you know, a, a, a large group of people. Plenty of children were there, but all the uh, other kids were running around playing and, you know, not paying attention like you should at that age. Yes. And, right. <laughs> and my son is studying every single object. He's looking. He's. Uh, it took us like three hours to get through the exhibit because yes. he had to look at every last thing for for a while, not just glancing at it, but staring at it. And we finally got up to an exhibit where it there was an actual boiler that they brought up from the bottom of the ocean. Wow which that alone was like, you know, took my breath away. I was like, oh, my God. And uh, so it was um, on display. It had curtains on either side, and it had mirrors on both sides. So when you look down at the mirrors, it looked like a whole line of boilers. Right. So, and it was, you know, it was, um, it was sad. I mean, there, the whole exhibit had a definite, you know, a uh, cloud hanging over sure. it. It was just, you know, very tragic and, and sad. And uh, so we're, we're looking at the boiler. We're getting closer because we're moving with a group of people. And my daughter is about a little bit taller than me. And, of course, Jamie was only six, so he couldn't see our, you know, 
he was not at our vantage point to see what we were seeing at that mm-hmm. time. So uh, I looked, you know, and I saw the mirrors, and I looked to the right, and I looked to the left, and to me I saw a life-size oil painting of a man shoveling coal into the boiler. Okay. And at the time, I remember telling myself, I specifically remember thinking, wow, they really went all out for this exhibit. I mean, that's, you know, that's really commendable that they went that far to do something like that because you could see, you know, how they were dressed. He was in, you know, heavy woolen pants with suspenders and a high neck white shirt. And, you know, um, he had a, a cap on and he had a mustache and, and uh, it just, it looked like, oh my God, what a, you know, what a horrible job in the first place. Mm-hmm. And then to think that, you know, they were trapped and they couldn't even get out when the, the ship was sinking, it must have been so incredibly terrifying. And uh, so as we got close, closer to that side of the exhibit, I, we actually, I looked up at the painting and when I looked up at him, he turned and looked at me like I scared him. Oh, that's creepy. And yeah, well, when when your mind sees a painting move, the first thing I did was close my eyes because I'm like, paintings don't move. Right. So it scared me, and I shut my eyes for not more than a, a split second, and I opened my eyes, and I'm staring at myself in a mirror, and there's no painting, and there's no man. Wow. And I, I leaned over at that exact moment. I leaned over to my daughter because I was just in utter shock. And I said, did you see? And she leaned over and she said, a man. And I said, shoveling coal. And she goes, mm-hmm, <laughs> with a hat on. And I'm like, yep. And we both saw him. But what her mind did when she saw him was she saw a man standing where there was nowhere to stand. So she was wondering, how did he get over there? You know, like, what is he doing there? There's nowhere to stand over there. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah, so we both saw him, and he saw us. He looked at both of us. His head swiveled really quickly, like we scared him. And when he looked at me, that was it. I shut my eyes. I was just like, oh, no, 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 this this doesn't happen. And uh, he he wasn't there. There was no painting. There was no man. It was just... Wow. There and then gone. And my son was too short to see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we didn't say anything to him because we didn't want to scare him. But we were, I mean, speechless. We didn't didn't even know what to think. So at the end of the exhibit, they they give you cards that correlate with people that were actually on the ship. Mm -hmm. And what was really weird about it, we traded cards so... My daughter and I had two females, and my husband and and my son had two males. And when we got to the very end of the exhibit, it shows you if you survived or not. Well, my husband had a card of an actually an older military man that did get off the ship. He actually survived. And then myself and my daughter were two women, mother and daughter, from Connecticut, and the daughter was an actress, which my daughter used to be an actress, and they both survived. And then my son's card belonged to a French-Canadian architect from Canada who did not survive. And he was so excited he couldn't read the the board that was posted with all the names. And he was frantic. He kept saying, did I I make it, Mama? Did I make it, Mama? And I looked at my daughter, and we just decided without even saying, and I just looked at him, and I said, yes, honey, you did. Look, here's your name right here. You made it. And he goes, oh, thank God, thank God. So we completely lied to him. Yeah. And uh, and he went, went home, you know, just completely happy as a clam that, that he saw, you know, saw that he survived and that he saw all these pieces of the ship. And um, a couple of weeks after, now we were hoping that this would bring a closure to him. Sure, of course. It, it certainly did to us. I mean, after we saw the man shoveling coal, uh, yeah, that yeah. was, you know, that was like, you know, I've always wanted to see a full body apparition and that was it. 
I mean, I saw a full body apparition that actually looked at me. You're a tough chick. I'm not sure I'm ready for that, much as I believe. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, well, luckily, I was in a crowd of people. Mm. You know, otherwise, uh, I, if I would have been alone somewhere, <laughs> I wouldn't have story. reacted so calm. And he vanished so quickly that without my daughter seeing it, I would have questioned myself to this day if I had really seen that. Yeah, of course. So did but this she stop, saw the same thing. Did this stop the, the night terrors that Jamie was having? Well, what happened was um, we came home. Uh, it had been a couple of weeks. He, I can't remember any uh, night terrors in between the, the visit to the Titanic, but a couple of weeks later, he had a night terror that I call the death dream which it was the most terrifying thing I have ever lived through with a child in my life. And one night I was home alone with him. I put him to bed. He had a twin bed with a uh, metal headboard Mm -hmm. that was up against the wall in his room. And I had put him to bed. I had shut the door and I was in the other room watching television. And all of a sudden I heard this pounding uh, from coming from his ben, uh, his bedroom, and it was like a boom, 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 boom. And I'm thinking, you know, oh, my God, what's going on? You know, I jump up, I run in there, I, I fling the door open, and my son is up on all fours. He's staring, he's in a crouch position. He's staring at the floor, and he is shaking so violently that the bed is hitting the wall. Mm, poor kid. And that's the the boom that I keep hearing, the bed hitting the wall. And he, I'm, he looks like, I mean, at at one point I thought, do I call 911? Because Mm -hmm. I thought he was going into a seizure. That's how much he was shaking. And he's, he's shaking and just staring at the floor. And I can tell that he, he can't see me. He doesn't see me. And before I, I even make a move to walk toward him, this voice comes out of him that was not a little boy's voice at all, and I'll never forget it as long as I live. This man's voice screams with terror that I cannot describe in words. She's going down. And I realized when he said that, oh, my God, he's, he's going through the sinking of the ship. Sure he is. That's what's happening. And I made my way over to his bed without, you know, disrupting him, even though I was terrified. I sat down next to him and I started rubbing his back until, you know, the shaking stopped. And I mean, he had sweated through his pajamas. He was, it was horrible. It was just the the worst thing ever. But he, he finally, you know, finally it faded. He calmed down, he laid down and he fell back asleep. And I was, I mean, I, I didn't know what to, to, to do. I mean, I, I was just like, he just remembered the sinking of the ship. He just went through it. I know he did. And the next day when he was up, I asked him about the dream he had. I said, honey, I said, uh, you scared mama so badly last night. I almost called an ambulance. You were shaking so hard. And again, with his, you know, dry humor and his sarcasm, he looked at me and he just shook his head and he goes, Mama, you know the water was freezing, right? Wow. <laughs> and I, I said, oh, yeah, I forgot. And he just kind of shook his head like, God, is she ever going to, you know, get this? And then slowly after that dream, the night terror stopped. He stopped. It was like, you know, it would go a couple days. He'd talk about the Titanic. Then it would be a week, and he would talk about the Titanic. And then all of a sudden, he just stopped talking about it, and it was just over. Hmm. And he, you know, went on to be a great, you know, human being. I mean, he's so well-adjusted, and and, uh, we were actually featured on The Ghost Inside My Child. If he still felt responsible, because they... They, we did a lot of research on it, and he does look, <laughs> he even looks like him, but we believe that he was Thomas Andrews, the man that designed the Titanic. Wow. Talk about being responsible. Yeah, yeah. And no he actually, he well, and he was offered a, 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 
uh, you know, a seat on a lifeboat, and he had a, a daughter and a wife waiting for him at home, and he chose not to get on the lifeboat. He went down with the ship because he felt that responsible for the accident. Hmm. And he said it was so it was so sad to hear him say it, but he said that if he had to do it over again, he'd do the same thing. Gee whiz. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it just makes me think of this. Um, the television show that you're on, on beyondbelief.com, it's a paid subscription um, TV channel called Guy Am TV. And for our listeners, it's, it's 99 cents if you want to join for a month and see the episode. Um, but uh, I've got the two-minute video clip from the episode, episode 85. If anybody wants to see like a two-minute clip, because it's got some of the pictures that her son drew of the Titanic in that video clip, and it's also got Susan talking about it. So, you, you mean the, the episode, the thirty-minute episode is or twenty-three-minute episode is great, and I have the link there for that too. But if you just want to see some of the pictures, I encourage you to look because it's wild. It's, it's just wild that a, a little boy would 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 do this. So, oh my gosh, and and what I'm thinking too when you're sharing your story, Susan, is I think growing up, all of us kids have maybe not memories of a past life, but we're happy to go lucky little kids and, and life's going great. And then as we grow up, that's when our ego or our identity or the little voice starts talking to us, whether we're good enough or, you know, whatever. And so I think when our minds get busy with, with life and we hit that age, I think it's around, what is it, maybe seven years old or so, um, that naturally he's paying more attention to the things that are happening in the now and then it would make sense that he's not in the world of you know the the past or however i'm trying to explain this so did he oh, just yeah. naturally kind of grow out of it and yeah yeah he just um it, it was so subtle it was like like I said, it would be, you know, the, the usual Titanic stuff, but then it would be a couple days in between he ever going to get over this. And, and it, it was a good idea to take him to the exhibit yeah. because he saw actual pieces of the ship and he saw a lot of recreated rooms. And what's really um, remarkable about the CD-ROM game that he had, they used that game in a, a future documentary on the Titanic because the rooms were exactly what they looked like on the Titanic. Incredible. So it was amazing that, you know, he, he drew pictures from memory also, but the fact that, you know, he, he knew so many details of what that ship looked like by being on it. There, there's, you know, it was years later before you actually saw real pictures and, and things like that. And uh, he was just... Um, you know, it, another thing that they didn't uh, have time to show in the Ghost Inside My Child is that the producers of the show actually ordered a copy of the blueprints that Thomas Andrews drew for the Titanic. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, they, they got, it was a one, one big sheet uh -huh. of, um, of like cross sections of the, of the Titanic. And then they showed it to me, but on the show, it, Pardon me. <clears throat> it was supposed to look like I had gotten him a gift and, and they mm -hmm. wanted him to see it on camera right. without seeing it before. And I really wish they could have fit this in because it was <laughs> it blew everybody in the room away. Um, we, we put it out on the kitchen table. Jamie was downstairs and the camera crew was ready. And they said, now call him upstairs and show him the blueprint. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. And I said, I have something to, for you to see come on up, and he came upstairs and sat down and started looking over the blueprint, and the camera guy um, whispered to me and said, ask him about the dummy stack and, you know, the smoke stack. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the blueprint, and I just see a bunch of different cross-sections of the Titanic. I mean, it, it looks like Chinese to me. Yeah, I, of course. You know, I can't figure out anything. If I, I would have looked all day, and I wouldn't have been able to show you anything. Mm -hmm. And we asked, I asked him, I said, oh, Jamie, I said, can you tell me on this blueprint where the, uh, the dummy stack is, the fake smoke stack? Well, it took him less, and I'm not exaggerating, it took him less than five seconds to point it out to me. He looked it over, and then he said, this one, this one right here. 
See, looking underneath, there's no intake valve for the steam. So this one is the dummy stack right here. <laughs> and all everybody in the room, you could have heard a pin drop. I mean, the, 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 we were completely speechless. And, the, and both the, the cameraman and the sound guy looked at each other, and, you know, you could tell on their faces they were like, what? <laughs> so that was really uh, quite the confirmation mm. that that Jamie probably drew those blueprints himself. And now he's into concept art and animation. He's in film school now, and he draws, I mean, his drawings are unbelievable. I was going to ask you about that. Did he grow up into somebody who's creative and drawing and continuing on? Oh, yeah. No, he is. He is. If you go to jamesmacino.com, you can see uh, the stuff that he draws on, on the computer. And uh, it, it's just amazing. It's yeah. amazing how good he is. I'll check that out. Thank you. That reminds me of the story. I don't remember the kid's name that was a fighter pilot and went down. Yeah, yeah. That was the first show of Ghost Inside My Child. That was, you know, no pun intended, that was their pilot show was that little boy that remembered he was in World War II. Right. And as a little boy, he was drawing all these horrific pictures of plane crashes. and. Oh, yeah. yeah. And he remembered everything. He remembered the aircraft carrier he was on. He remembered the type of plane he flew. He remembered, uh, he looked at pictures of the the guys he was in the, you know, the Air Force with, um, he remembered their names. I mean, it was just, it was an amazing story. I, I know that was in the national news. Yeah, he he remembered his sister's name, and um, I'll, I'll connect that on your page, too, on episode 85, just for people interested in other phenomenal stories of reincarnation. Susan, thank you, first of all, for sharing that, because I... I will never get sick of listening to you share that story because that is mind-blowing and to me it, it proves our soul's survival and, and then coming back. But you had also talked about um, something called Thursday's Child. Yeah, yeah. What, what was that, the story behind that? Well, that that's um, an organization in Wisconsin that is a lot like Make-A-Wish mm -hmm. where they they do things for um, children that are terminal. Their dying um, wish they, kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They try to make their dying wish come true. Um, you know, everything from going to Disney World to meeting a celebrity to, you know, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm kind of known, at, you know, <laughs> throughout the world now, I'm kind of known as the ACDC lady because yes. I've I've known the band for so many years that it, it's, it's just kind of comical in a way, <laughs> in a lot of ways. But, um, I was approached, um, a mus musician in town, her name is Connie Ward, God bless her, uh, she heard about this boy named Cody, 15 years old, he had terminal bone cancer. Wow. And he loved ACDC so much, he wanted to meet Angus Young, the lead guitar player of ACDC. And Connie heard about that, and she got a hold of Thursday's Child, and God bless Dorothy Ferguson, who ran the organization she just passed a couple of weeks ago, by the way, mm -hmm. um, her and her daughter, child. And so Connie got a hold of Dorothy and said, I know somebody that might be able to help you. So she got a hold of me and told me what Cody wanted, what his wish was. And uh, it it's, was not a small, uh, it, it wasn't an easy thing to do because when Angus is not on tour, he lives in Holland with his wife. His wife is from Holland. Okay. And um, I was actually writing the book, The Story of ACDC, Let There Be Rock, at the time. So I didn't want to approach the band directly because I didn't want them to think that I was trying to get them to help me with my book. Right. So, so I, you know, like this was going to benefit me in some way. So I set Dorothy up with who to call in New York, their business management in New York, and to get a message to Angus through them that Cody, you know, wanted to meet him. Or, you know, and they would have flown him if, if we could have. Mm -hmm. They would have flown him to Holland to meet him if he would have been well enough to travel. Right. But right after I was um, approached by this, you know, this whole setup, and I, I did as much as I could without getting myself in the middle because, I, again, I didn't want anybody to think that I was doing this to help 
my project out in any way. Right. So I wanted to stay anonymous. Mm -hmm. So um, what happened was uh, he was at the UW Hospital in Madison one night um, right before Christmas, and there was a big blizzard. I mean, it was just one of those nights in Wisconsin where, you know, everybody's off the roads or telling people not to travel. And the hospital called me and said, you know, Cody's up here, he's 15 years old, and uh, his mom, you know, lived outside of Madison in Fort Atkinson, and she wasn't going to be able to drive in that night to see him because of the, the weather, and they wanted to know if I could possibly come up and visit with him. Wow. Well, I was completely honored by sure. that. Um, I got in the car, and because no one was on the road, it really wasn't a bad drive at all to get up to the UW Hospital. And, of course, the magnitude of it didn't sink in until I went into the children's ward of terminally ill children, and I'm a mother, mm -hmm. and I ha had a son at home. And I completely had to pretend that Cody was going to be all right. Otherwise, I, I don't think I would have been able to keep it together right. to talk to him. And I went into his room, and uh, I brought him my um, my first book, Rock and Roll Fantasy, which had, you know, stories of ACBC in it. And the second book that I had out at the time was Famous Wisconsin Musicians. So I, I brought him copies of those, and I ended up sitting and talking with him for almost two hours. And he, what he wanted to know was he knew he was dying, mm -hmm. and he wanted to know what was going to happen after he died. Wow. And I was like, um, you know, I mean, to it, it's hard to even describe, like, how do you how do you talk to someone without getting emotional, for one mm -hmm. thing, and not wanting to scare him in any way? I kept it very light, and uh, I said to him, I said, well, you know, Cody, I have to tell you what I believe, and this is only my belief. So you have to, you know, remember that a lot of people believe other things but I believe that you are going to become like a radio signal, like, like your soul is going to go on and it's all going to be mental. So even though it, it's very scary, you want to stay as positive as possible because you will draw other positive vibrations to you. And I said, I always tell people that when I pass to not grieve too hard for me because in the first 48 hours I'm going straight back to 1960 Hamburg, Germany, and getting drunk with John Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and, and he cracked up laughing, and yeah. he's, like, he's like, really? He said, that, you really think that? And I said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. That's the first thing I'm going to do. Uh -huh. So I'm going back in time and getting drunk with John Lennon before mm -hmm. he, he's famous, and then who knows what I'll do. And uh, so he, he laughed at that. And he explained to me um, that his father, you know, he had a stepdad and mm -hmm. everything that he was close to, but his father had died about four years prior to this. Okay. And I said, um, and I know, you know, a couple of times he looked at me like, whoa, you know, wh what planet is this lady from? Because I said, well, do you ever see your dad? And he looked at me and he's like, um, he's dead. He, yeah. He's been, you know, dead for four years. And I said, I know, I know that, but does he ever come to you in your dreams? Hmm. And, and he said, well, yeah, yeah, I've seen him in my dreams. And I said, well, okay. I said, let's just put it this way, Cody. I said, when you cross over, your dad will be there for you. You will not be alone. And his eyes got really big and he said, do you really think so? And I said, why would he let you cross over alone, Cody? He would never do that. He loves you. You love him. He's your father. He'll be there for you. Mm -hmm. And that gave him a lot of comfort. I know it did. And he, you know, he and I talked and we talked about ACDC and, you know, he asked me all these questions about Angus and what type of a guy he was. And <laughs> we just, we just had a really great visit and, um, and it, it meant a lot to me. It really did. It was just such an honor. And, uh, so I, I went home that night and, I heard afterwards that all he, he all he did was talk about me. He ta oh. he talked about you know what's going to happen after he dies and his dad's going to meet him and and so I was really you know I felt good about that. And then one day I got a message that 
they had not gotten through to ACDC and his health was failing. So again, without doing it myself, I got Dorothy on the phone. I gave her the phone number and the name again, and I said, call them directly and tell them that Cody is running out of time. And sure enough, they got the message through to Angus. He wa- it was too late for Angus to fly here or for us to fly Cody to Holland. Mm-hmm. Angus called him at his home in Wisconsin, and by the time he did, Cody was unable to speak because it had gone into his lungs. But he laid in bed, and Angus talked to his mother and talked to Cody. He held, she held the phone up to his ear. Oh, that's so sweet. And he got to talk to Angus. He got, you know, Angus talked to him, and then he talked to his mother, and he got, he got his wish of Angus knew who he was, Angus was very honored by the fact that he wanted to meet, that was his dying wish to meet him. That was a huge honor for Angus. And and Angus came through just like I knew he would because that's the kind of guy he is. And what I found out is that Cody passed within 24 hours after that phone call. Wow. And I did not expect that he was going to die that soon. He died on Christmas Eve, or no, I'm sorry, New Year's Eve day. Mm-hmm. And uh, what happened was I came home and I was at a friend's and we were going to go out for the evening on New Year's Eve. We had um, plans to go out. And I came home and my husband sat me down and said, I got a message today from Dorothy. And I, he said, you know, I'd like you to sit down. And I looked at him kind of funny, like, what's going on? And And he said, Cody passed today. And I did not expect that. I expected that he was going to live for several months yet. And it just, I mean, it took me out. I was like, before I could even react to it, I saw in my mind's eye, Cody and his father walked through my living room. And Cody, of course, had no hair when I saw him because of the chemotherapy. Well, he had all his long hair. And he was walking with his dad and he walked through my living room and he was, he was shouting at me and he was super excited. He was super happy. And he said, Susan, Susan, you were right. You were right. It's exactly the way you said it is. It, it's exactly the way you said it is. And, and he was just thrilled. And that just went, he, he just passed through like a, a breeze. Mm. It was like a, like a moment that, that went by and needless to say, I couldn't, I couldn't go out that night. I, I sobbed all night long because it just, you know, I mean, he was only 15 and he was such a sweet boy. And uh, a couple days later, um, one of the hospice care workers called me and she said, um, I want, want to tell you something about his last day because everybody thinks you should know. And I said, oh, my God, yes, I, you know, what, what happened? How, sure. how, how did he, how was it, you know, was he in any pain? And, and she said, oh, no, 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 that, that's not, that's, he wasn't in any pain, but this is, this is what happened. The day that he passed, he insisted on being dressed in all of his ACDC stuff, his ACDC T-shirt, his jacket, everything that he had, including my books, were, were surrounding him in his bed. Oh. And he was on uh, on oxygen, so he had a mask on. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, he he lifted the mask up. He hadn't spoken for weeks. He lifted the mask up and said, not yet, Dad, I'm not ready yet. And then he put it back on. And everybody was just, I mean, the whole room didn't, I mean, they were shocked. They were completely shocked because he hadn't spoken in two weeks. And all of a sudden, about an hour later, he ripped the mask off of his face. He said, okay, Dad, I'm ready now. Let's go. And he died. Oh, my gosh. That's how he died. Goes through your living room. Yeah. And he, he went through my living room and told me it's exactly what you said it is. How incredible is that? And then even when you were being interviewed by George Norrie on the TV show, uh, George got a 
vision of him in his mind's eye and told you what he looked like standing behind you. I know, and George never does that. No. I've never seen, I love George, and I've listened to him for over 10 years. I have never seen him or, or heard him do that before. Mm-mm. And he said that Cody was standing right behind me, mm-hmm. and he described what he looked like. And the, the, the really cool thing about it is that I put Cody in the dedication to my Let There Be Rock book. Nice. And that book, um, Cody Jessup, and that book is now in 11 languages. Oh, congratulations for that. Well, thank you. But Cody is now known all over the world. That's really and- awesome, Susan. It, it's so cool. I mean, it is, it's just so amazing. And then to bring that story even uh, up to date, when ACDC went on tour, now um, this was, I believe, I'd have to look back, the, the book was still being written, so I'm, I'm going to say it was 2004 okay. when this happened. Um, when the band went out on tour in 2008, we went to see them in Chicago, and my son got to meet them. And my two girlfriends had to wait outside with the fans in the back where the buses were. Okay. And uh, they were taking pictures. Well, they took pictures. There were several tour buses. And when one of the tour buses um, took off out of the parking lot, they took pictures as the bus went by. And when the pictures came out, you could see a kid's face in the window of the bus. It was Cody. Oh. I swear to God, it was Cody. I saw the picture, and that's, it was his face. That's great. With a big smile. Of course. <laughs> so he not only got to go see ACDC, he definitely was hanging out with them. That's really awesome. I'm all choked up right now, like I could have a good cry. And what it's telling me, I'm sure I'm not alone in feeling this way, is you know, there's so many times that we think, this is stuff is made up or, you know, life after death can't be real. But when you listen to stories like Susan just shared, it is real. And, and when you have thoughts in your mind of maybe a loved one that's no longer with you, it may not just be a thought. They might be right there with you. And to trust that what seems like your, your imagination may not be, it's, it's reality, you know? Oh um, yeah. There is something so much bigger than all of us. Well, and, and again, you know, like you said, being a mother too, the fact that Cody passed so quickly, um, I was so honored to be able to know him at all and sure. to, to help him. And after he died, um, Angus and his wife, Ellen, actually sent a bunch of things to Cody's mom to make a shadow box for him. Aww. And he, he called, and, and after Cody passed, he called and uh, talked to his mother, and his wife, Ellen, talked to his mother to make sure she was doing all right. And uh, it was so incredible. I mean, it was, it was such a great honor to be part of that. Of course, and Cody lives on in your story, which now is being listened to by thousands of people worldwide. Um, Susan, thank you. Really, really <laughs> beautiful. So... All that being said, what else should I ask you? <laughs> um, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I know. Um, I, I'm being mindful of time. We could probably talk for another. <laughs> I think it's, it's to learn how to, to be as close to God as what we were meant to be. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of, um, you know, because there, there are things that I don't like. I mean, believe to die or, you know, because that's the worst. To me, that's the worst part of life is losing people. Yeah, suffering because, is what I call it. Anytime we suffer is horrendous. It is, it is, but it, but it changes us. And I, I, I look at it kind of like, um, I try to describe it as, as a clock where we're created at, at 12 o'clock sharp. Okay. And then every minute after that is a lifetime. And every lifetime, we, you know, we might be able to jump 10 or 15 minutes in one lifetime, or it takes us, a thousand lifetimes to get back up to the source where we came from. Hmm. And we, we can't get back to that source until we become that pure and that, you know, non judgmental and that open and love is all there is. I mean, we're here to love people. We're here to help people. We're, we're here to be the best people we know how to be. And I had to learn that when I was younger, I judged people. 
I, I thought all kinds of things of like, oh, geez, you know, what are they doing that for? And now I'm like, it's not, not for me to judge their path. Right. Everybody's on their own path, and if I can help them, that's great. And sometimes you can't. Sometimes that's a really hard thing to learn is that you can't help certain people that just don't want the help. And I, I tell people this about their, their speech and their thought is, is what creates their reality. And that's a hard thing to get a grasp on because I'm not perfect at it. But um, I love this phrase, and I wish I could credit the lady that wrote it. I should look it up because she deserves credit for it. <laughs> but she said um, that every negative thing you say builds another bar on your prison cage. Every negative thing you say, I'm writing this down. Builds. Yeah, every, every negative thing you say builds. builds another bar on your prison cage. Wow. That makes you think a lot about what you, how you say things. Yeah. Someone just you know? said recently to me, and then I read it a couple times even after that, is every negative thing you say or never negative thought you have, you actually have to put in 10 positive just to kind of override that one negative. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's negativity is, um, you know, and I have respect for the dark side, believe me. I have respect for it because... It is very powerful, although I believe that good overpowers evil. Mm -hmm. And we, every day, battle that. We battle that in our minds. We battle that in our everyday life. And it, um, and I think one thing, too, that really rewards you and the, the universe rewards you is gratitude. If, if you're grateful, even if, it, if you're having an awful day, but you still have a place to live and you have food in the fridge and, you know, you have your friends and your family. We have so many blessings that we forget about it. We take it for granted. Sure we do. Even getting out of bed in the morning. Some people can't walk. Some people have to be bathed and need help using the bathroom and all that stuff. So, I mean, there's things to find gratitude for, for sure. Oh, yeah. Even, like you said, the simplest thing, mm -hmm. getting up. And, you know, I used to have chronic migraines. Every day that I don't have a headache is a great day to me. Oh, that's great. You know, and, and that you can, you can do that, though. You can, you can wake up in the morning and think about it. It's a great way to start your day is to wake up in the morning and go over all the really great, grateful things that are happening to you. Be grateful to it. Send, send the universe love for that because the universe returns what you put out there. Mm-hmm. There's a great and book the, that, oh, sorry to yeah. interrupt you, great book that I've read a couple of times. It's called The Magic by the lady that wrote The Secret. Rhonda Burns is her name, and it's a 28-day yeah. gratitude practice. And, you know, I don't feel like waking up in the morning and being thankful for anything, but for the, the first 28 days that I did it, Susan, it was so funny because you, you do that every day. You give gratitude for 10 things, and you write it down and why you feel grateful for it. But then there's also exercises like grateful for the people in your life and why or grateful for a problem that you've had or a mistake you've made and why and I had more cool stuff showing up in my life in those 28 days and I have never felt happier like a sustained happiness that I did in those 28 days so I actually am on day three and I'm doing it all over again because no matter <laughs> what we believe wonderful I no I, I agree and, and Rhonda yeah. might have even wrote that uh, quote that I said about you know uh, every negative thing yeah. you say and, and you might because agree. I've read her secret the secret They're and um, it's just an amazing book the but magic, I, I have to get the book the magic I think I've seen it but I haven't read it yet yeah it's, it's a quick read because you only do one chapter a day and there's only a few pages per chapter but you are probably like me that even though we talk about this left to our own minds and our daily devices you know we forget don't mm -hmm. you do you forget who you are and what your life is for and you oh i, I have my days believe yeah me. of course yeah I, yep i do i do and i have a great girlfriend um uh that is wonderful uh and she's also a psychic medium Nice. And uh, we've gone on a lot of ghost adventures. We're going to Gettysburg in a couple of weeks. And she's great, Tamara. Uh, she's on um, Facebook, and uh, her name is Tamara Gleason. And uh, she's always right there to say to me, who are you? Who are you? Do, do you not remember who you are and wow. what, what a great life you've had? And, oh, my God, you hang out with ACDC. You, you have nothing to complain about. <laughs> <laughs> 
She is so good about slapping sense into me. <laughs> I woke up a couple of days ago, Susan. My mom and I travel uh, cooking for race car teams. That's our, our day job. And our last night in Florida, we just spent the night near the airport. Well, we had a, a room kind of like a timeshare place, but I had a king size bed overlooking a swimming pool and I had a big jacuzzi tub in the room. So I woke up that morning just cranky. I didn't feel good. You know, I just worked 18 hours a day for the past week. I mean, I was miserable and it, and it really took something for me to go, you idiot, look where you are, look what you have. It take a little time to be grateful, and you know what? I like I forced myself to feel good by doing some gratitude statements, and then sure. you know, I went into my mom's room and I just crawled in the bed with her and gave her all kinds of loving and just you know I was just so happy, you know. So Aww. we have the power to do this. It just it takes something. It takes something. Well, well, it does, and even in your daily life, you know, like Deepak Chopra says, always give somebody something, whether it's a smile or a prayer. It doesn't have to be a gift. And I know that when I go out during the day and I'm upbeat and I'm smiling and I'm cracking jokes and I, I always like compliment the cashier that's, that's helping me or something, it changes their day. You can tell, you know, they're, they're having a bad day or they're working really hard and in your you're like, oh, God, I love your earrings. They are so pretty. And their whole face changes. Sure it does. Absolutely. You can always find something to compliment somebody on. Hey, this reminds me of one last thing because I started reading your book. Um, and your book is Secrets of the Universe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is, might be a good way to just kind of close the show. But in the beginning of the book, you talk about, I don't remember what book it was that you read it in, but something about our cells, that our cells don't rejuvenate themselves like that we have the cells like repair other cells is am i getting that right oh yeah 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 um and i think this came from uh howard bloom howard bloom yep that's it which is a great guy oh my god is he a fascinating man and you should look into him too but he said that that even our cells if you go down to the cellular level of our existence Each cell does not feed itself, cleanse itself, or take care of itself. It takes care of the neighboring cell. And the neighboring cell does the same thing. It's like a domino effect. So if you take it right down to the cellular level, we are here to take care of the person next to us. And And someone next to us will take care of us. So it's, it's so amazing that our cells do that. Yeah, that that they that they're programmed to watch over the one next to them, mm-hmm. and uh, and you know, and also he said this too about heaven and hell, the difference between heaven and hell, and I do believe this came from Howard. And excuse me, Howard, if it's not your quote, but um, <laughs> I, I heard I, I heard this I heard hear everything on Coast to Coast. <laughs> I love that show, but uh, he described heaven and hell in uh, in hell. Everyone is at a, he said, imagine everyone at a banquet table filled with food and they're all, all uh, handcuffed to the table and they're starving to death. Okay, now picture heaven. They're all at a banquet table filled with food and they're all handcuffed to the table, but everybody is surviving because they figured out that they can reach up far enough to feed the person next to them. Wow. That's the difference between heaven and hell. Mm Mm-hmm. So Zig Ziglar has a quote, even though I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's like you can get everything you want for your life by making sure other people get everything for their life. Something like that. It, right. When you really put your focus on others, you get everything back by so much. Oh, definitely. By yeah, so it, it, it comes back is so much. And, and again, it's hard to remember that because we have our lives, we have our problems, you know, you've got health, you've got kids, you've got bills, but if you just remember that one little thing of like, you're here to love people and be loved. It's really simple. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. I think we'll close the show with that. Oh, you're, thank you're you an so angel. much. How do people find out more about you? Well, um, they can go to susanmacino.com. Um, all my books, all six of them are on amazon.com and you can find me very easily under my name on Facebook and Twitter. Yep, Susan, Susan, S-U-S-A-N, Messino, M-A-S-I-N-O. 
Susan Messino has been our guest, and I'm so happy. This oh, I, that, that was, I loved it. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And just for our listener, first of all, thank you for spending the last hour with us. But it was over a year ago that I saw Susan's video, and Susan and I were back and forth about her being on the show. And then I think you got a cold, and you couldn't talk. And then I went off to a race, and then it's just been totally forgotten about. And I woke up the day before yesterday, I'm like, I got to have Susan Messino on the show, and you just happen to be free. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing the story. And um, also for our listener, remember to go to wedontdieradio.com. Check out episode 85. And so I'll have that video uh, of Susan being on the Beyond Belief show. Um, I'll have links to some of the things she talked about, to Howard Bloom and... Um, her books and, and everything I can find about her because she's fabulous. So, Susan, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I can't wait to get together with you in person. This will be fun. Um, oh, I know. Oh, if you if you travel through anywhere, you know, near Savannah or, you know, just keep me posted because we have to get together. We do. And I have a dream, and this goes for our listeners, too, of having a cruise that we talk. Maybe we meet once a day and over meals and we go to some cruise in the caribbean and we have a we don't die cruise and we have some of the guests that have been on the show and really empower you to live a phenomenal life maybe like i said an hour in the classroom in the morning or something just to empower you and then we do some fun things together i think that would be a great idea and susan i think you'd be perfect for oh, that cruise. I, I think people would love that yes I do, That's too. That's a great idea. I know. And if anybody's <laughs> interested in this cruise, feel free to write me at Sandra at SandraChamplain.com and just let me know. Because you know what? Even if just a small group of us showed up, that would still be okay. It could be the first annual We Don't Die cruise. Okay. So all that being said, thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, remember to check out SusanMessino.com. In closing... This is Sandra Champlain. I hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as I have. I have been your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. So thanks for listening and we'll see you soon.